All right, thank you everybody for coming. Welcome. Welcome to your after lunch talk. Hopefully you can stay awake, and we can as well. Uh, we'll try to help a little bit with that. Um, uh, my name's Kevin Hillman, and this is Patrick Titiano. Hello. We're from Bay Libra. We're gonna be presenting the next talk uh, called Lab in a Bo Introducing Lab in a Box. So, um, a little bit about us. We're kind of embedded Linux consulting company. Um, doing all sorts of things around embedded Linux. You can read kind of this as you like. Um, but actually, I want to tell a small, a, a funny story before I start, because last time we did a talk like this where they cut the ballroom, uh, they split the ballroom in half, I was just about to start talking, and I opened my mouth, and then the person from the next room over started talking, and they had, mis they had miswired the sound. <laughs> so I opened my mouth, and somebody else's voice started actually coming when I was talking. <laughs> And it was really weird. It was like coming from above. It was kind of, it was pretty, it was yeah. pretty funny, but um, uh, that didn't happen this time. So thanks to our audio team, they're, uh, they're on top of it. You sound okay today. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it sounds different. Yeah. <coughs> what was that? Oops. I don't know what that was. Um, anyway, this is, a, this is a little preview. So this is the lava box. So if you, if you really are more interested in somebody else's talk than our talk, Basically, what Lava Box is, uh, I'll tell you in one minute, and you can go to the other talks if you want. This is a this is a PC case with a bunch of embedded Linux boards jammed inside, running Lava and uh, set up for automated testing. So uh, that's what the Lava Box, the Lab in a Box is. Um, we're going to go through all the details, but uh, this is kind of the the preview. And uh, tomorrow night at the technical showcase, um, we'll have the Lava Box there if you want to come and see it. You can see inside and and uh, and have a look for yourself as well. Um, so a little bit of background. Um, I want to tell you a little bit about the kernelci.org project because that's kind of the, the framework or the environment that we've been working in and developing and contributing that made us kind of come to a point of wanting to develop this, uh, this lava box. So if you haven't heard of kernelci.org, it's kind of a, it's a distributed um, test framework kind of built towards, built, uh, focused on testing the upstream Linux kernel. So we are testing uh, the Linux kernel, the latest Linux kernel from mainline, from Linux Next, from all the stable trees and everything. We're testing it on over 250 different boards. Um, so every day, anytime there's a new commit in any of these trees, mainline, next, stable, a handful of developer trees, um, it gets built and it gets boot tested on a whole bunch of platforms, uh, mostly ARM and, and ARM64, but also x86. Um, we're starting to get some interest in MIPS, and so we have some MIPS platforms that are being added right now. Also, RISC-V is, is in the conversation as well. Um, <clears throat> but that's, that's basically what kernelci.org is. So its, its main thing is it's distributed. So there are labs uh, all over the world. There are about 10 different labs that have a handful of boards each that kind of contribute to the kernelci.org. Um, and the results are reported on the website. There's also a mailing list where you can sign up for this. So the kind of target audience has been kernel developers. So they want to see if you, you make a change to some subsystem and you, don't, you can't test it on, obviously, all the hardware that Linux runs on. It's a kind of a, a useful tool, for, especially for maintainers and kernel developers, to find out if the stuff that they just recently submitted actually is still working on the mainline, uh, on the Linux kernel, as it tests on a bunch of different boards. So that's a little, just a little background on kernelci.org. Um, if you want to know more about this project, the previous ELCs, we've done talks on kernelci.org project as a whole, so there's stuff in the ELC archives on, on this as well. Um, just a little bit about the kernel CI loop. So just standard CI loop, there's, there's, you know, you check something into Git, it gets built, it gets distributed to all the test equipment, and then it goes back into the, um, so this is kind of the kernelci.org kernel CI piece here, is kind of contribute, is, the web UI and kind of the back end where all the results are stored in the database. Um, and what's interesting in this context, the lab in a box contest is, so we're talking, we're gonna be talking mainly about this piece. So how do you actually, how the tests get actually, once the, once the kernel gets built and is ready to run, how does it get distributed to the hardware that it runs on? So these, these, this box here is basically one example of a lab, a board farm, and we've done it kind of a, a simple board farm crammed into a PC case. And that'll be just an example lab that can contribute to kernelci.org. So on a related project, the Linux Foundation Automotive Grade Linux Project um, is the, the CIAT part. This is the Continuous Integration Automated Testing uh, Expert Group inside of AGL. 
is also leveraging lava and kernel CI infrastructure as well. So we've been working with AGL actually to, uh, to leverage kernel CI and expand the testing for AGL to a, a wider variety of hardware and especially more tests. Um, <clears throat> so it's, it's also using this kernel CI infrastructure and it has a handful of boards that need to be tested and also be distributed to different labs. So different member companies from AGL, for example, could have lab, the boards that they care about and collect them all together and have a distributed test infrastructure. So all that's just kind of background to, to get to what this lab in a box is, and that's kind of motivation that brought us to actually developing this. So Patrick will tell you a little bit more about the lab in a box itself. Thank you, Kevin. Yeah, so um, in this context, um, let me try to explain you and develop what the lab in the box concept is. And first, I'll start with the motivations. Uh, why did we want to design this lab in a box, what it is, what's the starting point? So first, our motivations. Well, the number one mo motivation was this one. This is currently what a lab looks like in most of the cases. And well, I think it's time to go pro. Uh, we have done enough of the experimental phase, and now it has to go pro and be a production grade thing. This, this one is my office, by the way. Yeah. So. I'm not, so, I'm not trying to shame anybody but myself. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. And this is, the, on the left, this is the one we have in Belibre, France. So. so that's the first motivation, but that's the, not the only one. Uh, the other one is that we really want to simplify the administration of the Lava Labs uh, we have around the world. Uh, Lava is clearly today the leading uh, technology it's a nice technology, it's a still evolving technology, but it is still uh, difficult to get into it. Uh, the installation process is known to be painful. It's getting better, uh, particularly thanks to the, uh, Docker use, the use of Docker technology, uh, but it's still complicated. Uh, we, have to deal with, we have to deal with many different configuration files, like device types, devices. Uh, this is pretty, pretty difficult to set up, uh, particularly for new boards. We also need to deal with the, the serial console. You may know that when you connect your serial uh, USB cable, you need to look for the right TTY device. It's not something that is automated. And, well, for newcomers, it's always a pain. Um, all this to say that we believe that at some point, uh, <coughs> uh, board farms uh, users should not uh, actually be aware of all these internal technologies. At the end, we'd like someone to, build, to be able to build a, a CI lab without having to deal with all that. It, it was just build and run, and that's it. Uh, so that's really what we want to achieve here. Uh, other motivation is be, allow people to easily duplicate or scale their labs. In the first picture we show, clearly it will break at some point. Uh, it's okay if we have 10, 20, 30 boards eventually, uh, but just think about 100 boards, that's not possible. Just think also about corporations. You are not going to sell that solution to anyone. So that's, that's really one motivation here. And in the end, uh, we can say that we want to accelerate the deployment of such labs, because the more labs we have, the more testing we can do, the more branches we can test, and so the the higher the quality of the Linux kernel can be. Uh, based on those motivations, we, uh, we have listed some requirements. Uh, number one requirement being that we want to do a, an all-in-one solution, integrating everything. So the Lava instances, the master, the, the, the dispatcher, all the devices under test, so the boards, uh, all, all the power supply units, all the connectivity, the wiring, everything. It has to be uh, an all-in-one solution. And because this is developed in the context of the AGL uh, project, uh, we will integrate also, we want to integrate all the community and ref reference uh, boards for AGL. As usual, uh, the lower the cost is, the better it is. So we'll, we'd like to keep the cost down. Uh, we want something scalable and reproducible. Uh, but also uh, safe, robust, and maintainable. 
just imagine uh, having those wires on the table. Anything can happen. You can just stop by and remove a cable. You have no idea which device it was. Uh, you can, well, you know, uh, a cup of coffee or a glass of water can fall into it and bam, it's gone. Uh, and when you want to add or remove a board, it's always taking, a t it, it's always taking some time. So we want to get rid of the, all that. Uh, we, are, we also thought of all the home workers. So again, no one will, would like to have this in his apartment, but a PC case, well, you have your PC already, so it's just another one. Uh, and last but not least, it has to be well documented, which we know is a difficult point for open source projects. Well, I should have, actually, we should have listed one, one more requirement is that everything is open source. Mm. And it is. Okay, so for, uh, so there, there will be challenges. We, we knew there, there will be challenges for uh, driving this concept. And here are the two main ones. Uh, we know that there will be a lot, of, there is a lot of stuff to integrate all together. All the boards, which has, di or they all have different dimensions. There, there's no standards in two board size. Eventually, you have the business card size and a couple of standard size, but the, the wiring, the, way, the, the, place, the placement of all the connectors, it's all custom. Uh, we need uh, something, uh, a, what we call a power control unit, so something that will be able to power on, power off boards uh, dynamically. Uh, all the connections, so the wires, uh, we need uh, local networking, we need some, uh, we need to connect all the USB uh, the debug consoles, and for, so for each board that we will have to be under test into our, our lava box concept, uh, we will need to have a cable for power, for the debug console, and for the uh, Ethernet. Uh, so 10 boards, uh, 30 cables, you can imagine. And the other challenges will be, given that it, there's a lot of integrate, it, it still has to be maintainable. So it should be easy for uh, maintainers to add or remove boards uh, if, if it's needed. And here it is. This is our lava box. So everything packed into a PC case. So there's been a, you can see that compared to the first pictures of the board farms we, we've shown, well, there's been some road <laughs> taken. Uh, but let's, uh, let's have a look inside. So here you can see all the different pieces uh, we have integrated into this PC case. And I'm going to try, I, I, I will describe all the pieces, all the parts, but uh, and also explain why we have made this choice. So why a PC case? Well, uh, the PCs, uh, you can have a PC for quite cheap price today. And uh, you already have everything you need for, to run the Lava instances. You have to know that running Lava today is, um, is quite difficult on, uh, or on regular ARM-based development boards because there is some requirements on, on processing and uh, also on storage and also on um, RAM. Uh, we have to download large uh, TAR files uh, with all the, the kernel and the root FS, it has to be uh, decompressed, so that's, that's requiring some processing and some storage, and also all the time, so we cannot use something that is based on uh, flash memory, because it's going to be burned into, uh, burned very quickly, sorry, so that means more SSD kind of thing, or hard drive. Uh, uh, Lava is based on Python and Java, and uh, it, it runs a web, a web server and everything, so RAM usage is quite high. And so in the end, we decided to use a regular PC, but it's an only, only all-in-one, sorry, a mini ITX board with a fanless quad-core CPU. Uh, so it's fast, it has eight gigs of RAM and, uh, and a SSD drive for fast access. The second interesting point of using a, a PC case is because there is a very powerful and cheap uh, power supply unit. So for like a few uh, tens of dollars, you can get a 500 watt power supply, regulated, stabilized, protected. 
you have 5 volt and 12 volt uh, outputs, which are the standard voltage supplies for our development boards. So and it has many connectors. So we could reuse that for, to power all the, the, the boards. Uh, or I mentioned that we needed something, a uh, unit to control the power to the boards. And here we have decided to reuse our uh, own uh, power measurement and power cycling solution. It's called ACME. Uh, so it's based on a, uh, a cape for the Beagle Bone Black and with uh, power measurements and power switching probes. So that's what we are using here to control the, there is six boards integrated in this uh, example. There is obviously a USB hub to collect all the debug consoles. There's a network switch uh, to give uh, connectivity, uh, local connectivity to all the device on those tests. So this generates a, a local internal uh, network. And uh, what boards we have integrated in this example is a Raspberry Pi 3, a good old uh, Beagle Bone Black, a brand new uh, low potato board. So this is running AM Logic S905 uh, X uh, processor. And Belibre is actually in charge of doing the upstream support for this board. So that's why it's integrated here. Uh, we have a Dragon board uh, from Qualcomm uh, based on uh, Snapdragon 410C. Uh, since this is uh, used for the AGL project, we have the uh, mandatory uh, Arcair uh, Aircar M3 starter kit board from Renesas. And then also we have integrated uh, the Cyberlite uh, IMX6 board from NXP. So here is a closer loop on the wiring and all the different parts we have integrated into the PC case. Okay, so let's <clears throat> talk a little bit more about the internals of the, the hardware and the, the, and the software, especially. <clears throat> Pardon me. <laughs> seems to be related to, it seems to be related to me pushing the button on this. Then when it, so maybe I'll use the, maybe I'll use the yeah. keyboard here. Um, unless that's actually somebody else's voice that I'm from another room. <laughs> Okay, so uh, as Patrick mentioned, there's uh, lots of USB, so there's actually a USB hub inside the case to connect all this together. So primarily, the USB is used, we're using USB um, for USB serial converters for all the serial consoles, for all the boards. So because this is an embedded conference, everybody knows about hooking up the serial to their, to their board, so that's no surprise. Um, one thing we did notice over the years of kind of maintaining lots of boards in a few labs is that I've, or we've have, uh, USB serial dongles from just about every vendor on the planet, whatever happens to be cheap when we're buying. And what we've noticed over the years is the, the cheaper ones, just after a couple months, you find them, they just, they just flake out, they just stop working. You unplug it, you physically unplug it, you plug it back in, boom, it's working again. But obviously that's not very, that's not useful for automation. So what we found over the years is the FTDI ones are just, you know, they're way more expensive, but they're also way more reliable. And then in general, the FTDI ones also have unique uh, serial numbers on them. So like UDEV rules can be nice for unique, you know, identifying a cable that's put to a board because it's got a unique ID. So that just, it simplifies things. Uh, it costs a little more, but it greatly simplifies things. Um, and yeah, I have no idea why some of those, some of those USB dongles just stop working. They, the TTY just disappears from Linux and you unplug and they come back. So I, I haven't actually debugged that, but um, anyway. So yeah, so we use FTDI for that. Um, so USB, the serial consoles are one USB. Some boards also have another USB just for power. Um, so you can power that from the hub or you can, uh, um, so there's yet, yet more USB serial cables. Also some boards that are driven over fast boot, you, sometimes there's a separate USB connection for the fast boot as well. Um, so you have one for the serial console, one for the fast boot. So this is why you don't just need a, you don't need a single USB part per port per board. Sometimes you need two. Um, and also some of the boards, they, if they don't have actually physically networking, they might have USB gadget ethernet or something. So there's another USB cable to do the, so that they can do their networking over USB gadget, for example. So you end up with, you know, for just a few boards, you end up with quite a few USB cables. <clears throat> so you want to have a, you know, de reasonable size hub and a reliable hub as well. Um, 
and uh, yeah, so that's just all the different types of USB that are involved in this. Um, how big is the USB port? I think we only we we have a 10 port USB in there right now for six boards. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. How do you? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the question is, how do you secure the jumpers on some of these boards like a Raspberry Pi where there might not be good connections? Maybe you can answer that because you actually put it all together. Yeah, we usually try to stick the cable. So because, yes, we know that the connection is, could be tricky. And so we secure the cable itself so that it, stick, it sticks everything together. And it works. It, 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 uh, yeah, the, the lava box took the, the plane a couple of times, and it's still working. So that's our test. <laughs> you also have a hot glue at the end if you really. <laughs> yeah. Eventually. Yes. Can you buy them pre-assembled? Yes. So the question was, can you can you buy it pre-assembled? <laughs> yes. And so uh, power distribution. Um, so like Patrick said, we're using just a standard PC power supply. The nice thing about these ATX supplies, there's five volts and 12 volts. And there's also the standby power <clears throat> on the ATX supply that's the five volts. So you could use that to run like the BeagleBone that's controlling the Acme, for example. So there are, there are ways you could use the, the non-switched uh, five volt as well. Um, and the other thing we, we learned the hard way, the first build we did of this box in France, we bought a kind of a lower end power supply and didn't realize until a couple months ago when we took the box to Japan that it actually didn't do 110 volts, it only did 220 volts uh, for Europe. And so we actually had to replace, the, we had to buy another power supply, one that we could actually do 110 volts. So that worked because the, this lava box was traveling to Japan and then traveling here. So. Um, yeah, if we learned that, we didn't even, we just kind of assumed that the power supply was going to do both, but it turns out the cheaper ones may only, may only do one voltage. So. so for power switching, there's a couple of ways to do this. The, the cheap way, there's lots of cheap kind of uh, GPIO controlled relay boards out there, you know, four of them or 16 of them or whatever. Those are pretty inexpensive. You can drive them right from a BeagleBone or from a Raspberry Pi or any sort of embedded board that's doing, that has GPIO connectors. Um, so that's one way we chose to do, because we have this Bay Libre Acme board, we use that because we have them and they're easy for us to use. Um, and so that gives, they're a little bit more expensive, but it also gives you the ability to not only switch power and power cycle, but it also gives you to measure power at the, at the board level. Um, so that's a useful feature. And because there's only, we can only fit a finite number of boards in here, the, the Acme actually does eight, eight channels. And so that's about what you could cram into a PC at this point at least, and have it look reasonable. So networking, the, you saw the switch in there, so all the boards <laughs> are doing networking because the, the way that Lava works typically is the board boots up into the bootloader, whether it's U-Boot or Bearbox or something, and then it uses TFTP to actually fetch its kernel and its device tree and its RAM disk and so on. So all the boards are essentially net booting um, to get off the ground, and so they all need to be connected uh, on the network. And we've done this with Docker internal networking. So all the boards inside the PC are actually on kind of their own private network. Um, and then the Lava server kind of exposes itself to the rest of the world, but all the boards are kind of on an internal LAN. Um, which is nice because sometimes boards, especially running mainline kernels, do interesting things to your network. Uh, and if you just hook it up to your office LAN, you might have some surprises when boards come up with hard-coded IP addresses that happen to match your router or something and it's in your, it's in your office, uh, you might have some problems. Um, so it's a way to just, it's a nice way to keep things kind of isolated. Um, and the, it does need internet access if you want to hook it up to something like kernel CI because kernel CI is doing some centralized build and stuff and then can send jobs. You can do push or pull from kernel CI. So you need an internet connection if you want to hook it up to, uh, to you know, some external projects. But there's no reason you can't run this on an internal LAN and submit jobs locally as well. So onto the software piece, um, we've been talking about Lava a little bit, so I'll give a little bit of background on Lava. Um, similarly, the ELC has, over the years, has had several talks on kind of other aspects of Lava and details, so I'm gonna give kind of a high-level picture of Lava and particularly just the pieces that we are, so you see how it's used in this project. 
Um, but lava is basically cut into two pieces. It's got a master and slave part. So the, the slave is also called a dispatcher in the lava documentation. So the lava dispatcher is kind of the, the piece that actually manages physically all the, the physical connections to the boards. Um, and it provides all the services that the boards use. So like I said, when the board boots up, it does net booting. So it'll typically do a DHCP and to get an IP address and then TFTP its kernel and device tree and RAM desk. And sometimes it'll then mount a file system over NFS. So the lava, the lava dispatcher is actually what's serving the NFS file system or in some cases NBD file system. And sometimes for running tests, you, the, the board will boot up and then it wants to go fetch some tests or set, fetch some files to run tests. And so the dispatcher can also provide a web service so that the boards can actually fetch things or test some web, web tools or whatever. So the dispatcher basically provides kind of the interface between the boards and the rest of the world and also a bunch of services that it can use. So those are all managed by the Lava dispatcher. Um, it also manages the power control. So when, a, when the Lava gets a job for a given board, um, it knows that it just has to power cycle that board to start it booting. So the dispatcher manages all that stuff. So you have to, when you define a board, you tell it what you know, how basically you give it a command line or give it some, some tool that it's going to use to actually do the power cycling. So in this case, it'll be a, a little command line that tells the, the Acme board to, to switch, the, switch the power on a particular port or something like that. Um, there's also this project called PDU Daemon that's out there that's, uh, that's, pretty, that's used in a lot of lava labs. It's kind of a, it's, it's kind of a way to abstract different types of PDUs. So it could do Acme, it could do you know, rack mount APC type web, web switchers and things like that. It's just an abstraction for PDUs. That's a, it's a useful tool. It's not a necessary tool. But, um, but anyway, the point is that the, it's the Lava dispatcher that actually you configure for that for each device, basically how to, how to do the power cycling. It also knows about the serial consoles and where the UDEV rules are for your nice, uh, your nice FTDI cables with unique IDs. Uh, that all gets configured on the Lava dispatcher side and then basically how to connect to the consoles, whether it's Sir2Net or some other. You need to tell Lava how it's going to connect to the serial console so that they can start sending commands to U-boot and things like that. So all that stuff and all the other USB connections, fast boot and everything is managed by the, the Lava dispatcher. And yeah, feel free to stop or raise your hand or yell anytime if you have, if you have questions along the way. No worries. Um, so the Lava master side or the Lava server side is kind of the, the, the basically provides the web interface or so provides a way that you interact with Lava uh, from the web to control things and stop things. It also provides when you're sending lots of jobs to uh, say you have one, one particular type of board and you, have, you want to send a whole bunch of jobs to a BeagleBone, for example, um, and you only have one BeagleBone, the Lava server is the thing that kind of gets all the jobs and schedules them based on priority and kind of queues them all up. Um, so it has, a, it has a, pr a priority type of thing where jobs can have different levels of priority and preempt each other and so on. Um, it also provides an XML RPC API for other tools, non-web type tools, where you can drive Lava from some Python scripts or other. The Lava project itself provides a few command line tools that actually interact directly with this API. So you can do a lot of stuff by driving Lava from the command line. <clears throat> That's all interacting with the Lava server. And then it also provides kind of the, the way that boards are actually described, all the stuff about, that I was saying about um, how boards are configured, the serial port, the power switches, all that stuff. That description, the description files actually, even though they're connected to the Lava slave, the description and configure files actually live on the Lava master. This is one of the more confusing things about, about Lava, but uh, even though all the physical connections are on the slave, you define the configuration files and store them on the master. Um, Anyway, and the, the, these types of files are thing, in Lava, the terminology is device type and device. So a device type is like a, a board, like a beagle bone or a dragon board or something. So it defines a, a, a kind of a class of boards. So you might have, you might have uh, 10 beagle bones. They'd all share the same device type, but each one of them has a unique serial console and a unique way to power cycle, cycle it. So they're all of the same device type but every one would have a separate device configuration file where you tell it where the serial console is and where the power is and stuff like that. Um, so that's kind of the device type and device is the Lava terminology for, terminology for making that difference. And the, the important part here is what we've done is kind of taken a Lava install and kind of dockerized it. So we've made separate uh, Docker container for the, the master 
separate Docker container for the slave, and we kind of put them together um, using Docker Compose. So you, you can't really read this YAML file probably very well, but it doesn't really matter. The, the point is that it's, uh, it's kind of using this Docker Compose tool, which allows you to define basically applications that are made up of multiple containers and how the containers actually talk to each other. Um, so that's what we've done. So we've got the, uh, the slave as a separate container, um, the master as a, as a separate container. And by default, they'll run on the same machine, but you could also run those, you could run them on different machines as well if you wanted to run. Yeah, go ahead. What did you do about the Postgre Pardon? The Postgre, uh, so right now, in the, in the current software that's available, it's still totally plugged into the, the Lava uh, master. But we have a work in progress. Actually, we have a development branch where we, you can actually connect it to an, either have the, the database itself be a separate container or just connect to some existing database, yeah. Sorry, I didn't repeat the question. The question was, what about the, the Postgre database and you know, where is it and how is it containerized? So it's, uh, yeah, right now, it's, it's still, it's still inter too integrated, but it is a, it's been a request and it's in progress. Oh, the other thing, I, the, down here, the, the third container here is actually a squid. It's a, a, just a web cache because Lava's, Lava will, when you give it a Lava job, you can tell it to download the kernel from here and download the RAM disk from here. And so often it's running the same jobs over and over with the same kernel. So we put a squid cache in here as well. So if you're actually doing multiple jobs that are downloading the same images, it's just a little bit of a speed up. Um, so all the stuff we're talking about here is just kind of the way we decided to put things together. Um, so this is just one example. Obviously, I mean, we, we've had a lot of questions on, well, can I do, can I add this, and can I add that, and can I change this, and, you know, this is open source, this is, this is an open world, you can basically do whatever you want. So I just wanted to be clear that what, what we've done and put it all together is kind of our way of doing it. Our dem it's mainly an idea to demonstrate the concept. Um, you can pick your own boards. You can do whatever you want. You can pick a large board and jam it in there any way you want. Uh, we've done only small boards because we're using slidable, basically, disk drawers to get in there. But if you have a big board you want to get in there, well, you can buy a bigger PC and cram it in there and do, do whatever you want. But the, so yeah, it's, obviously, it's, this is kind of DIY. Um, we have our example, but uh, you, know, you, can do, you can do it however you like. And we've documented on the, oh, I didn't mention here on the, the bottom of this, this page here shows the Lava Docker project, the, the GitHub for the Lava Docker project. Um, <clears throat> and the README on that project actually goes through the documentation, <laughs> the, the different pieces here, and how we put it together, and how you actually would configure if you are going <clears> to. <throat> the, the quick start for the Lava Docker project is a QMU only. So there's no hardware, but so the, it'll show you how you set this up really quickly with just a QMU device. And then it'll go through how to start adding boards. Uh, one by one, but obviously the QMU is the easiest one to describe because there's no there's no physical connections to worry about. Yeah. So with, uh, do you need to run these containers Yeah, that's the way we're doing it now, I believe. I mean, you could set up your UDEV rules as well to create devices that have more more general access and you wouldn't, sorry, the question was do we need to run the Docker containers as privileged to access the, the physical devices and stuff and um, we are doing it privileged at the moment but it's not a requirement. I think that's one of the things we have on the things to do is basically clean that up so it doesn't have to run with privileges. I think so, the other reason it needs to run with privileges if you want to expose, if you want Docker to actually proxy some privileged ports and things like that, you need privileges. Uh, the question is, do we have a bomb with a part list? Yeah, <laughs> some kind of, yeah. yeah. Does a text file count? <laughs> <laughs> OK. It's pretty easy to provide that. No one can bounce or anything. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, to be honest, we are a little bit behind on the documentation side, but... Uh, We've been working well, mostly on the documentation for the software pieces of how it all fits together, but yeah, we can work on the... the that should be relatively easy to put together yes. a list of hardware pieces.
Okay, go ahead. Okay, uh, thanks, Kevin. So, have we uh, achieved our goal? Well, that's the question. I would say, do you remember the first motivation? We started from that, and we achieved that. So I guess the number one motivation uh, was achieved. Uh, we, we changed from a messy uh, desk to a nice uh, all-in-one solution in a PC case. Uh, but that's not the only uh, achievement, we believe. So we have a fully functional lab. So it, it processes uh, kernel CI jobs uh, on, on every board that's inside, and it's uh, operatable 24-7. Uh, so yeah, we have a fully functional lab from this pers perspective. Everything has been integrated into a single PCK. So what's nice with this prototype or concept is that you have this case. You just need to connect the power to plug in the, the network, that's it. Ob obviously, uh, load the software and configure it to some extent, but in terms of uh, wiring, that's all. So we think this is a great achievement. Uh, we have no more wi wiring, no more boards on, your, on our desks uh, or shelves. Uh, it's OK to have it in an apartment for home workers. It's under your desk. You, you just forget about it. It's, uh, it's, fan, it's fanless, actually, so you don't, you, don't, you don't hear anything. It could be fanless. Uh, oops, sorry. Uh, we believe it's a very good demonstrator. You will see it tomorrow if you come at the technical showcase. Uh, it's uh, catching eyes, and it shows everything well wired together, all integrated. So to demonstrate it's possible to, to do some uh, evangelizing of uh, the need of CI, well, it's a good demonstrator. We have put all the device under test into uh, a drive trays, so that means it's easy uh, to maintain. If we want to change a board, whether because it's broken or we need a donor one, we just slide out the tray, put the new board back in, that's it. Uh, someone asked about the, the, the bomb and the cost, so it's quite reasonable. Uh, today, the cost is about 500 euros, uh, everything included except the devices under test. Uh, this could be further reduced if you can recycle uh, an old PC, uh, because any PC from uh, more than five years is still OK. It's just it requires, if you have four gigs of RAM, that's it, it's OK. Uh, so again, if you have some USB hubs already or some uh, network switch, you can just reuse it. There is no requirement on it except the number of ports, obviously. Uh, we have done some, from a software, from software perspective, we have done some automation uh, for the, regarding the uh, installation, uh, but it's still a work in progress, to be honest. Uh, we have uh, containerized and scalable software, so that makes uh, life more easy. Still, uh, even if we achieved many, many, uh, many of our uh, goals, there are still some limitations. Uh, the first one is that it's pretty tedious to build and quite difficult to mass produce today. Uh, it's handmade, everything is custom, so, and it's packed into a PC case. And to be honest, we did not really realize the amount of work we, we had to do to put all those cables inside. Um, there are some limitations with the dimensions of the boards you may integrate into this PC case. So we have the 3-inch and 5-inch uh, uh, traditional base, uh, PC base. And, well, there are some limitations coming with that, and also the, but also the height of the board. If you have a board that has, I don't know, high uh, radiator or fan, could be a problem to integrate eventually. Um, uh, that's not really a limitation, but um, each uh, ATX connector, from, so from the PC, has a, a maximum current it can allow. So it's typically around 4 amps. So you, when you use a, a SATA or a Molex connector, you can get five amp or, uh, 4 amp of that. And well, you need to balance that power among all the boards you have in your PC case. Do not exceed this maximum power per cable. 
Uh, initially, we thought that, well, today we have, we, we've used the standard tower case, but if we put a larger one, we will integrate more boards. That's not exactly true. Uh, because of this internal wiring, actually, yeah, there might be more slots for the boards, but uh, that's too many wiring and too many network hubs, um, yeah, switch or hubs. So that doesn't scale very well in terms of PC case size. It's, it scales well because just, okay, you have six in one, you, with one PC case, you can drive six, uh, six boards. If you need 12, you just put two PC cases and, and so on. Uh, and uh, the last limitation is that, well, the, that's because it's all custom, is that every new board you have to integrate as a custom location uh, for the connectors. And so you have to deal with that. There's no, nothing standard. There's always things uh, to improve, of course, and here are a few ones. Um, first, uh, well, it's not really improved, but it's a, a better choice. We could have made a better choice with the ATX power supply uh, because we used uh, the, the, the power itself is pretty sufficient. We used a 500 uh, watt PSU, and that's more than enough to drive all the boards. But the fact is the larger uh, PSU you use, the more uh, SATA and Molex connectors, connectors you get. And that means that makes it easier to power the different device under tests. Uh, typically, we could, if we have used a larger one, we could have directly drive, use one SATA connector per board, and so we didn't have to balance. Uh, in terms of uh, development boards, well, we need to think about how to integrate larger ones, so more than five inch. Uh, in terms of administration, we haven't yet really provided any control panel. That's, I think the, we, we think it's something that, that is key and missing in many of the tools we use today. If we had a, a panel that we, we would just use to, you know, uh, use menu and click some box, text, uh, some checkbox to configure all the things, that makes life very easy. So that's where we want to go to some extent. And also in terms of uh, complexity and pricing, uh, if we, you wanted to use uh, such a uh, solution just for a single or two uh, or dual board uh, lab, it's actually pretty difficult and uh, expensive. And in terms of uh, documentation, as I said previously, we are a little bit behind, uh, but it's a work in progress. So what's next? Uh, well, uh, our lab in the box uh, concept was a first experimentation uh, to validate the concept, actually. So we wanted something really low cost, as much as possible, to target individuals and small groups. Uh, and next, we want to address more use cases. So the one, one board lab, so what we call it the mini lava box. So you just have one board, that's the board you are using every day, and you just want to run CI on it. So how to address that? We want to also address a more professional grade uh, solution where we would use racks, uh, the standard racks, instead of PC cases. That's to address uh, corporations. We really want to enable more software autom automation, both in terms of uh, in installation and in administration perspectives. We need to address the connectivity side of it. Uh, you may have noticed that it's all wired <laughs> connectivity uh, networking. There's no Wi-Fi or Bluetooth, and we know that, well, today in the IoT world, it's pretty <laughs> mandatory. Uh, we'd like then, once I would say the CI thing is running, we'd like to start working on standard jobs, standard jobs that would run on the boards. So again, to help people not have to develop uh, the, their own test and re reinvent the wheel every time. And of course, work, work on the documentation. So by the way, we have put on this slide uh, the documentation available today. And that's it. And if you, do, if you do play with the GitHub projects, you'll feel free to raise issues or questions just using the GitHub you know, issue tracker or whatever, and we'll, we'll get back to you on that if you want to play with it, or if you find stuff in the documentation that's not clear or whatever, let us, 
let us know. It's, <clears throat> it's a quick start is available now, but the, <laughs> the more full stuff is still being worked on, so. Any, any other questions? Yeah, go ahead. Hey, given the top two, uh, do you want to add peripherals, like a secret CPU or something, on the cabling that David back here? But you might want to test, let's say, a driver. Yeah. Something along the so the question is, have we given any thought to adding additional boards like GPIO connected things or I2C connected things? Yeah, we have in, in, the, in our kind of regular lab, we have more setups like that where there's additional hardware. But I mean, we haven't thought about it in, in the context of this in the sense other than, yeah, it just complicates the wiring. But it, it, doesn't, it doesn't make anything harder except for finding space in the PC case is really where it goes. Yeah. <clears throat> There's not yeah, much if, it, if it's small enough to fit in a bay, OK. Uh, you may have noticed, we can go back. Uh, there's one board. So it may not be possible for all the boards, but yeah. Uh, this for this one, you see you have more space. Yeah. So it's already possible. And you may reuse, here you have two bays, two five-inch bays. You could fit more, more peripherals. But it's true that because it's leveraging the kernel CI.org project, currently it's uh, kernel booting and some kernel testing, but there's not much yet peripheral testing. Uh, this, this has been already discussed. And potentially, we could try to find a way to provide connectors for outside. Like, the box is still the box with internal devices, but also allow external uh, device on the test to be connected to it. That's very cool if you could expose the pin from the outside, so you could get exactly. more things in and out without having to take it Exactly. So that, that's an idea. Any other questions or comments? Yeah. You might have to be a little bit louder. Right, so how much custom hardware is in there? So the only thing custom is basically the, the Acme cape. It's a, it's a standard, uh, it's a standard be um, BeagleBone Black cape that we built at Bay Libre and we sell as a product. But you could also just put in, you could put in any sort of relays to switch power in there that you like. But that's the only thing that's not really, well, it's off the shelf in a sense. You can go to our website and buy it. But um, that, there's nothing else custom in there other than, you know, yeah, actually custom the, cutting of the wires to the right length so they're not, you know, a bunch of loops of cable around. But, <clears throat> yeah, the, 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 there was a comment on the install page about you need to have good soldering skills and stuff. Yes. So the, yes. Yeah, and so speak to that a little bit. Yes, uh, so yeah, in terms of tinkering skills and soldering skills, so we have done a lot of integration in this work. So this Acme solution is uh, the standard one. So you buy it to the store and you, you use it as it, no problem. It's more about the mechanics and putting all together that was all handmade and custom. So uh, cutting wires. Um, also, the, the, all the connections from the PSU, so the ATX PSU, to the different, uh, to, to, to drive the power to the, um, to the different boards, we had to cut all the uh, Molex connectors uh, and find, use uh, uh, all things to cable that together. So it's not really shown here. The, 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 really the, yeah, it, it's about finding a mechanical solution to, uh, to have, it, have it something fixed in, the, in the, the case. The other soldering might be that if you're, some of these boards, the connection between the power switch, the relay or the Acme, and your board, um, you know, you yes. buy a, you have a barrel connector and you might just, you know, when you make that custom cable just the right length, you solder the connections on. Yeah, so it's little, little things like that. We're not doing any, so we didn't modify any boards and yeah. like little soldering on boards or nothing like In that. In terms of soldering, Simple. it's really making custom cables. That's yeah. it. Everything, by the way, everything was ordered on Amazon. So it's, uh, it's very easy to get. Any other question? Anything yeah. else? Yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's a good idea. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks.
Yes? Yeah, so there seems to be a lot of custom cut acrylic also for melt melting de devices, the plexiglass. Yes, stuff yes, cut. yes, yes. Yes, so again, yes, we we just uh, bought uh, a large uh, large pieces of plexiglass and we cut it ourselves and uh, make all the holes that we needed. So yeah, that, that's the mechanical and tinkering skills I was uh, referring to. Yeah, there's nothing standard here. Yeah, that would that would make sense if we want if every lava box was going to have exactly the same boards in it. But I think in this in this environment, I think people are putting different boards in different, and every board has a slightly different form factor and different mounting holes and stuff. So it's, it's so on it's, it's this part, yeah. Uh, so yes, for these ones, for for these guys, that would be very helpful because yeah. it's standard. Yeah, that's standard. Um, but that for these guys on the the right hand side, it's um, it's going to be custom every time, almost. Oops. Okay, I think we're out of time here. It's 10, 10 till, yeah. So I think we're out of time. So thank you very much. Thank Thanks you. for coming. And, uh,